hemoglobin, which is, consists of four different subunits shown in different colors, and each subunit carries a, a moiety called a heme, which has an iron atom which bonds to an oxygen molecule. So this is a protein that carries oxygen from our lungs uh, to our blood to go into the tissues. And this is a protein called rhodopsin, which is present in our eyes, and it's a very sensitive photon detector. So you can see proteins carry out a wide variety of functions. In fact, they carry out thousands of functions. And that's why if you stop protein production, effectively none of the essential reactions in the cell uh, will uh, proceed, and so you'll end up killing the cell. Now, to understand how proteins are made, proteins are made using the information in our genes, okay? So our genes are made of DNA, and as I pointed out, they consist of four different types of building blocks, and this is a more uh, chemically accurate representation uh, of this very simplified uh, cartoon. So uh, the backbone of DNA consists of a phosphate, a sugar, and phosphate alternating, but each sugar is attached to a different kind of base that is complementary uh, to another type of base. So you have four bases, but A will only pair with a T, and C will only pair uh, with a G within the context of the helix, of a double helix of DNA. Now, it's the sequence of these bases that contains information on how to make proteins. And that's a, that was a big puzzle uh, in the early days of molecular biology. So uh, here's DNA, and DNA is copied. One of the strands of DNA is copied to make a rather similar molecule as far as information content goes called RNA, which is a crucial difference that instead of deoxys, instead of just a proton here, you have a hydroxyl group here uh, at the two prime moiety of the sugar. Now you have to go from the language of nucleic acid, which has these four types of bases, to the language of proteins. Proteins are long chains of amino acids which fold up into the shapes that I showed you. For instance, in those three proteins I showed you, they had very different shapes. But all of them start off as long chains of uh, amino acids that fold up into their particular shape, depending on what the protein is. And so we need to go from this language to this language, and that's uh, 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 what used to be a big puzzle. And the way that's done is you have DNA, which is a double helix, and it gets copied to a single strand of RNA, which also consists of four different bases. And now you have to go from here to the language of protein, which is a chain of amino acids. And the way that's done is groups of three bases are read to code for an amino acid. And uh, Crick correctly predicted that there would be an adapter molecule, and that's called tRNA. And what tRNA has, this is simply a cartoon of tRNA, it has three bases that base pair uh, with the triplet, with a group of three bases on mRNA, just like the bases base pair within the double helix. So it's the same kind of chemistry of base pairing that occurs in the double helix, but this time it's between tRNA and the RNA messenger RNA moiety that carries the information. So you can see that a tRNA comes in, it recognizes its triplet and pairs and brings along its correct amino acid. And then the next tRNA comes in, and it brings in its amino acid, which is different, or, or may, it could be the same, but potentially different. And then these two amino acids have to be uh, joined together. And then the process has to continue along uh, this genetic message. So essentially, we're taking it, genetic information, information present in our genes, and using that information to make chains of amino acids, which are proteins, which fold up. <clears throat> now, clearly, this doesn't happen uh, by itself. And that was realized very early on when uh, people who are looking at where newly made proteins were in the cell by labeling using radioactive amino acids and doing electron microscopy, they showed that uh, newly made proteins localized on these particles 
on, in the endoplasmic reticulum. And these particles were isolated, and they contained, uh, they all were about 250 angstroms in diameter, and contained two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. And it turned out that all species of these particles, th these particles from all species consist of a large and a small subunit. And these particles were called ribosomes. Now, I'm going to, sh most of you know Jim Watson because of his discovery with Francis Crick of the double helical uh, structure of DNA. But it turns out that his lab actually uh, pioneered uh, some of the early work on ribosomes. But uh, because he didn't actually do the work himself and didn't actually write the papers, but he allowed his students and postdocs to work very independently, he didn't put his name on any of the papers. Now, there's a novel concept that perhaps, you know, uh, big, uh, you know, Indian scientists might uh, take note of. So uh, here he is talking about uh, the early days of ribosome work. Oh, one minute. So uh, it is true that in Watson's time, in the late 50s, it would have been impossible to determine the structure of the ribosome. But it didn't, didn't stop a, a large uh, community of biochemists worldwide from characterizing the ribosome because it was so important. And they first figured out what the ribosome is made of. Uh, there are about 50 proteins and three uh, pieces of RNA and bacteria. And uh, then they showed how the subunits would assemble, and this is what an uh, electron microscopy uh, image of the ribosome looks like. And then uh, about 40 years of biochemistry showed that the ribosome, uh, the small subunit binds uh, to the genetic message, and the ribosome has slots in it for these tRNA adapter molecules. And the way that happens is the first amino acid binds, and then the second amino acid binds in the second slot, and that uh, enables a bond to be formed, uh, which perhaps Tom will talk about in his talk. And so you get a bond between the first and second amino acid. And then the whole assembly has to move, and so that, that results in the first tRNA being ejected, and then uh, the ribosome assembly is moved to the next triplet, and then the third tRNA comes in, and then a bond is formed and so on. So you can see from this picture that 
the message, the information is being read here while the uh, polypeptide chain of amino acids is being synthesized over here. And that's done by this large, uh, complicated machine called the ribosome. Now remember that my cartoon picture, this is a highly simplified picture of the ribosome. And the first breakthrough was in understanding what this tRNA molecule looks like. And actually, it doesn't look like this. It's simply a conceptual cartoon. It looks like, like this. It's L-shaped. And here's the anticodon triplet that ba base pairs with the triplet. So this base pairing actually occurs here, and the amino acid is brought here. Okay, And this is the view of the ribosome we had in the kind of early 90s, where uh, here's the small subunit, and it binds the message, presents the triplet. The L-shaped tRNA binds uh, the codon here, and the amino acid is brought here to an active site where peptide bond is catalyzed, and the nascent peptide emerges through a tunnel in the ribosome. Now, this was, of course, tremendous progress from knowing nothing about the ribosome to knowing a lot about it. But if you want to understand uh, the, the nature of the ribosome in chemical terms, and if you want to understand how antibiotics bind to it, you need a high-resolution structure of the ribosome. And uh, to do that, you have to understand how we normally uh, visualize small objects and, and, make, and see detail in small objects. The way you do that is, uh, if you have a small object and you want to look at it in detail, typically you would use a lens. And what a lens does is it collects scattered rays from the object and recombines them. And if you use your lens correctly, the image will be magnified and then you can see that with your naked eye. Now, in fact, all of you are using lenses to make an image right now when you're seeing the screen, because the light scattered from the screen is going all over the auditorium, and you're, you're taking a portion of that light, and you have a lens in your eye that recombines the rays and forms an image on your retina, and that's why you're able to see this image. However, there's a rule, of, there's a law of physics which says that you cannot distinguish detail that's smaller than the wavelength of the light that you're using. And the problem is that light has a wavelength of about 5,000 angstroms. And the distance between atoms in a, uh, in, a chemi in a molecule is typically about two angstroms. And so uh, you, you cannot, uh, using light, you know, ordinary light, uh, use a magnifying glass like, or a microscope in order to de discern details at the atomic level. You can use a technique called, uh, you can use light with, of a much shorter wavelength. And if you use light of the appropriate wavelength, which is one to two angstroms, those are x-rays, okay? So x-rays are simply photons, just like light, but they're much shorter wavelength. The problem is that there's no lens that will uh, actually recombine the rays like an optical lens. There are lenses developing now, but they don't have sufficient, uh, they're not there where you can look at individual molecules. The second problem is that x-rays are damaging. So if you look at a single molecule, just like you would look at an object using a magnifying glass, the amount of x-rays you would need to get enough signal from a single molecule would actually destroy the molecule. So even if you had a very powerful lens, you wouldn't be able to get uh, a using continuous x-rays anyway, uh, an image of the object. But there is a technique uh, that you can use to circumvent that, and that's called x-ray crystallography. And in x-ray crystallography, what you do is you crystallize your object, which means you form very regular three-dimensional arrays of the same object, uh, like, the, like the ribosome. And you take that object and you put it in an x-ray beam and you hit it with x-ray.